Greetings, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I am your host, Mark Hassera, and for over 24 years, I was a KC-135 pilot flying all over the world, passing gas, and loved every minute of it. Since I was five years old, my passion has been aviation, standing underneath airplanes landing at Los Angeles International Airport. On the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, we debrief some of the most incredible pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. Our purpose is to hear the tactics, techniques, and procedures they cultivated during these extraordinary and extreme military, commercial, and general flying operations. By doing so, we're trying to understand how does the aviation world work and improve critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. Today's episode is brought to you by Wallpilot, custom aviation art printed on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to the walls of your home, office, or hangar. Previous episodes of Lessons from the Cockpit can be found at my website, markhasera.com, under the podcast pull-down box. And folks... I have really been looking forward to this episode. It took me a while to reconnect with Navy Captain Dave Mongo Koss. He was the strike lead for the opening night of enduring freedom over Afghanistan and Iraqi freedom over Baghdad. And he's got some great stories to tell about that and leadership when he was the commander of the Navy's Blue Angel demonstration team and what it takes to prepare for an air show. Grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Today we have Captain Dave Mongo Koss on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Welcome, Mongo, to the show. Thank you, Sluggo. Great to see you again. It's great to be with you. He was one of the contributors for my book, and we spent a lot of time talking on the phone. I still have that notebook, by the way. So, Mongo, tell all of our listeners a little bit about who you are and where you went to school while you were in the Navy, particularly now that the Top Gun movie's out. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks, Logo. Like I said, it's really good to see you again, really good to to connect. One of the great things about the military is you always end up together again, chatting and reliving old stories. It's one of my favorite parts about having experience in the military. Uh, Dave Koss, in 1991, graduated the Naval Academy. Selected aviation out of the academy and ended up in flight school in Pensacola and then Meridian, Mississippi. Selected uh, F-18s after that. Went through primary flight training there in El Toro, California to date myself. Back when uh, El Toro was open, it was primarily a Marine Corps base, but they trained some of us naval aviators, Navy aviators, I should say there. But then went on to do uh, multiple tours on the East Coast. Was in VFA-87 a few times, CAG-8. Transitioned uh, to Hawaii for a joint tour. And then ended up on the West Coast for a few tours to include a command tour of VFA-14, a Commodore tour there in Lemoore, California. And in between all that, was fortunate enough to be a a Blue Angels commanding officer, as well as a a Top Gun graduate. So that's a a little bit of my my career in a nutshell. Oh, my gosh. So you have a lot of Hornet experience. Yes. Great name. Yes. And, and, And you know what, Mongo? Everybody who listens to the, any show hears about doing a night trap mm-hmm. on a carrier and explain to people why that is so scary so that they understand this is not a natural thing. <laughs> not a natural thing at all. So a, a trap itself is unnatural and scary. And, and the trap you're referencing, Sluggo, is what we affectionately term as an aircraft carrier landing. And basically, it's trapping aboard the aircraft carrier. And why it's so unique is because the the aircraft carrier itself is about a thousand feet long, but the landing area, which is canted 10 degrees off the waterline of the ship, just to provide a little bit more of a space to land, is only 300 feet long. And in that 300 feet are four wires on some of the older carriers, three wires on some of the new carriers. Setting yourself up for approach, a 17 second groove length is what you're shooting for during the day. Bottom line, you end up with a centered ball. What is a ball? It's basically what we call the meatball. It's a light source. It's a vertical light source that's in the middle of a horizontal light source. 
And what that shows you is your glide path. The scan is meatball lineup angle of attack. So looking over at the meatball, making sure it is you're, you're on the right glide slope. Lineup, obviously you want to land with that center line right between your legs because there's very little room on the outside of the wingtips when you land. And then, of course, angle of attack is the difference between the cord line of the wing and the relative wind. And in the Hornet, it was 8.1 degrees, which means we were coming down on a three degree glide slope with 8.1 degrees angle of attack. And what that does is it sets up the optimum eye to hook ratio so that when you're flying that centered ball, hopefully to touch down the hook touches down uh, right in front of the three wire on the four wire ships or the the two wire on the three wire ship. So, so that's, that's a little bit more information than you asked for on what a trap is. As you can imagine, it's a pretty stressful event, right? Cause you're coming in at about 160, 170 miles an hour of closure, you know, 140, 150 knots, and you've got to absolutely nail it to catch that. We go to full power every time we touch down in case the wire misses we can get right back airborne again in the event that we do what's called a bolter. Again, full power just to get back airborne. But to answer your question, you talked about a night trap. So that's all the stuff that we do. And I talked in detail about it, what it is during the day. But at night, that's really where we earn our pay because take all the visual cues of being able to see the ocean, being seeing, able to see the outline of the ship. And realistically, what you're now relegated to is just the lights of the runway. So we come in 10 miles behind the ship, uh, 1,200 feet, drive into the three miles, and then start that three degree glide slope to ultimately land on a ship that's 60 feet above the ocean. And I'm here to tell you that ship looks pretty small when that, uh, that 10 mile point and it looks pretty small, even at that three quarters of a mile in close position when you start flying the ball. And what people don't realize, too, is the ship is rocking, rolling, heaving, swaying in bad conditions. I've done it in an F-14 simulator at Oceana, Mongo. Scared the living daylights <laughs> out of me. <laughs> and that was just the simulator. Imagine that was just the real- simulator. In real in a, life. In a Tomcat, in a D model, okay? Your blood pressure is up. Your heart rate's up. You're sweating. All of us have heard the combat missions sometimes are not as stressful as a night weather carrier landing. Absolutely. The night carrier weather landing is where we earn our flight pay. Yeah. You were deployed on 9-11 when 9-11 happened. You had already been out in the Middle East Talk to us about your recollections of that particular day. You guys were coming offline and all of a sudden now you're thrown right back into the breach. Yes. So actually we were uh, on the aircraft carrier enterprise. We were in CAG-8 and we were in the Persian Gulf and actually setting sail to the south to go to Cape Town, South Africa for a port visit. It was the backside of deployment, and I'll never forget, everybody remembers where they were on September 11th, but I'll never forget being in the ready room on the aircraft carrier and somebody saying, turn on the TV, and it was evening for us. If you remember, the attacks happened in the morning here in, in the U.S., there in, in the, the middle of the Persian Gulf. It was, it was evening time to us, and somebody said, turn on the TV, turn on the TV. Again, we had just left the Persian Gulf. We were off the coast of uh, Pakistan when we saw the second plane hit. The, the carrier just stopped and started circling. So evidently there was some intelligence that was shared that potentially those attacks uh, were generated from somewhere in the region we were in. So we literally stopped, did circles there off the coast of Pakistan for three weeks while we gathered the intelligence and eventually put the story together of of who was responsible for it and started uh, developing those target sets. And we basically spent three weeks flying out over the ocean, doing what we call mirror strikes, you know, setting up the tanker bridges, which you're very familiar with, setting up all the logistics that we needed to do what we needed to do and practice, practice, practice until finally after about three weeks, we started flying over the coast of Pakistan um, in flight refueling and then started heading into Afghanistan for some of those missions. And these target sets and target folders, they're not complete yet, are they? They're not. They're not. As you can imagine, the intelligence on the ground to put those together. We didn't have a lot of imagery. It was just something that, that we, we didn't have fully developed. No. So when we first started going in, we spent a lot of time ensuring that we knew what the target set was and that we had it 100% right before we ever released any ordinance. Now, you mentioned to me, I was on one of the very first nights 
get up to a tanker and it's full. And you talked to me about timing out. Talk to us about that particular mission. Cause if I remember right, you also told me you had like the squadron nugget on your wing at the same time too. That's a, that's a great memory. And, and to be honest, I get a little nervous even just thinking about that story again. I had a young, brand new, the fleet replacement squadron wingman on my wing and we get up to the tanker and it's, it's pure math. A, it's how much gas, as you know, you can give and B, all that takes time. So we know in, in minutes how long we can stay airborne. And we also know how long it takes everybody to get gas. So we pulled up to the tanker and let's call it for ease of math, 10 minutes per aircraft to get a, to get across. We were eight and nine in line. Oh, so, geez. right. We couldn't, we couldn't wait the 70 minutes for the seven aircraft in front of us to get gas. And guess what? Everybody else was in a low state as well. So we couldn't go, you know, raising the flag and saying, Hey, by the way, me and my brand new nugget wingman are low state. Can we move to the head of the line? Cause everybody needed gas. So I'll never forget. It was one of those, uh, one of the things I appreciate about the Air Force tankers is they were they were always where they needed to be. So I'll never forget asking them, is there another tanker? And they said, yes, 100 miles northwest of our position. And they have give. And it was a leap of faith to leave the bird in the hand that we were on. But knowing that we may actually flame out before we even get our opportunity to get into the basket. So we literally left the tanker we were on, ventured with no approach control, no nothing across Afghanistan into the northwest sector. And just as beautiful as the the, the sunrise on a great morning, there she was, <laughs> no chicks behind her, found the tanker, rolled in behind her and just like a tick filled up till we could drink no more. So I will I will never forget that uh, again, a gamble because we the bird in the hand wasn't necessarily going to work out. But we knew that if there was a fragged tanker somewhere else, we could make that risk and make that flight to go uh, to go make that to, to further the mission. What a great lesson on trust. You trusted that pilot because fortunately for the tanker bros and sisters, our reputation is we will be where we are supposed to be at on altitude, on time and ready to refuel. Good thing it had a basket on the end of the boom, huh? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. If it wasn't the right fit, it would not have been it would not have been able to provide us fuel, as you know, as you're referencing for the for the people that aren't familiar. The uh, Air Force aircraft have a very different apparatus that that they receive fuel from. And and the basket you reference is one of the most glorious visions I've ever had was pulling up behind that tanker and it having just that beautiful basket out that we stick the probe in and, and get that fuel. And you did this at night, too, didn't you? Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Now, normally the Navy calls our basket the wrecking ball. It weighs 251 pounds. And yes, it has taken canopies off. I, I know when you're in a low state like that, coming up to the tanker, getting the gas, cycling your wingman through, you cycling through, guys getting like 2,000 pounds. They got some comfort gas. Okay, I'm out here. Next guy in. Been there, done that many times. The tankers have saved so many pilots in a situation like that. A hundred percent. And you guys 100%. went off from there and struck targets too. Yes, absolutely. We were uh, we were laden with JDAM. You know, you that's you're exactly right, and I'll I'll toot your horn as well. You guys were always where you needed to be, and yes, it's always a joy to see the tanker, but it's also a roll the sleeves up and let's squeeze the black out of the stick for the next ten minutes because it is just some it's some really tense time. And I'll, I'll tell you another funny story that you'll appreciate real quick. You guys are always so where you need to be to the point where I'll never forget. I launched on an Iraq mission, and we were supposed to meet you at twenty two thousand feet. And it was solid goo from a thousand to to twenty four thousand, but clear above twenty four thousand. But we had to use rendezvous in the clouds on you guys at twenty two thousand feet. And then when we got there, say, hey, any chance you guys can move up to you know twenty four thousand feet? We can operate in clear air. Oh sure, but we had already been through the the white knuckling stress of trying to find and rendezvous on the tanker and just the the pure goo at the pre fragged altitude of 22,000 feet. Yeah. Sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake when they're, when they're in the weather. <laughs> and you know what, <laughs> Mongo, that comes from our training because we're told to fly instrument flight rules, rules to the maximum extent possible. That was the way strategic air command did it. And it wasn't until I got to Kadena where my F-15 buddies 
you know, would come slap me upside the head and say, Hey dude, 2000 feet higher and we can be in the clear. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. We'll move up now. And, <laughs> and we'll get into some of that Southeastern Turkish weather when we talk about the uh, Iraqi freedoms, Iraqi freedom stuff. Cause those wow. are, were some fascinating missions. You guys continue flying these missions and, t- and the target sets are all coming together. You know, what kind of weapons were you guys using and what kind of missions were you flying in the early portion? Cause you're the first group there. Yes, you bring up a couple good points. First off, the target sets at first weren't real mature, as we talked about. Uh, There wasn't the opportunity for intelligence to get in there, fully vet all the target sets, and we just didn't have the intelligence and the situational awareness that would have made it easy to do what we used to call in the old days an alpha strike, right? Where we just get the whole air wing together, go in there, have pre-planned targets, you know, release and come home. Because we didn't have the mature target sets and data, we were doing a lot of on-call stuff. If there were any people on the ground, we were doing a lot of CAS or close air support, right? We were getting called in and supporting people on the ground. But for the most part, it was a lot of being airborne, having JDAM on board that we could program while airborne and and waiting for calls from either people in the air, feeding through the the strategic command and, and, and delegating targets or again, from people on the ground, bottom line, not a lot of pre-planned missions, a lot of get gas, go be on station and be ready, go get more gas, go back, be on station, uh, be ready. But but to answer your question, a lot of flying around with a lot of JDAM and flying around in a very responsive mode. We rarely launched from the aircraft, air, uh, excuse me, the aircraft carrier with pre-planned targets. It was a lot of be flexible, be ready to support whoever needed it. That's an amazing thing because you're kind of hanging out and you're using gas, a lot of gas while you're hanging out. Now I interviewed an F-15 Strike Eagle Wizzle, F-15 Strike Eagle Wizzle, and they didn't even have close air support in their doctrine at the time. How much training had you done with special forces on the ground calling targets and doing nine lines and all those kinds of things for these kinds of targets that you were after? Well, the interesting thing is it is one of our core competencies that we do train to that. If you can imagine when we left on that deployment, we didn't foresee that as the primary mission that we'd be doing. So to answer your question, we always do it. We always train to it, but not nearly to the level that we would have had we known it was going to go down. And obviously since both of the Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns have happened. We practice that mission a lot more because we've learned the value of it. But to your point, it's a core mission set of ours, but not one that we practiced prior to this point extensively. And you mentioned, too, that you're carrying JDAMs. You're probably carrying GBU-12 laser-guided bombs at the same time, too. So Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You guys were carrying mixed loads of, of both? Yep. We can carry- Go ahead. No, uh, we, we, you know, the... the, the um, the efficacy of both can be argued in different scenarios, but the ability to drop a JDAM with pre-planned coordinates, a real benefit, but also what you're teasing out here is having a laser guided bomb where we can be self-sufficient, where we can find the target, laser it ourselves, and then release the bomb with really good accuracy without having to get those mensurated coordinates from the ground was also a, was also a benefit. So to your point, yeah, mixed load provided us with a little more flexibility. And on top of this, too, you're flying escort missions for the F-14s that are doing TARPs, the B-1s that are flying missions out of Diego Garcia. I mean, you have a really mixed bag of missions, Mongo, that you guys are flying. Yes. And it was, you know, flexibility was the key to the day. And, you know, they joke about the the F-18 being the jack of all trades, master of none. And that was kind of one of those. uh, Granted, I I think we're masters of a lot. But the the point being, we did have a, a different mission set every day. And it was interesting to get that ATO, that air tasking order and look at it and say, okay, what am I doing tomorrow? And sometimes it's on call cast. And like you said, sometimes it's escort. Sometimes it's go out and just do recce, right? Because we were still just trying to mature the target set and make sure we were a hundred percent getting it right. So would you guys do reconnaissance also? I, I know the F-14 was flying a lot of TARPS missions and they were taking miles of pictures of film and all those kinds of things. Were you guys also involved with that with your targeting pods or? We, we could, but the, the TARPS was more of a mature mission 
than the F-18 going out and doing that. So it wasn't necessarily something that was often scheduled, but but a capability that we could do to go out and help with, with the ground reconnaissance, not something that was a, a, a real mature mission of ours. Now, you were designated a strike lead because of your training. Yes. Explain to our listeners, what does a Navy strike lead do? What are his roles, his or her roles as a strike lead? As the name implies, a strike lead is basically the one who's responsible for the overall evolution of a strike. And a a strike is is simply an air-to-ground mission. And I shouldn't say simply because... When we do, and that's one of the things, you know, with the F-16 and the F-18 coming online, we became strike fighters, right? So obviously we wanted to be able to be really good at both striking or air to ground and fighting air to air. The advent of the multi-role aircraft, uh, we had to get really good at both. So a strike lead is one who is responsible for the success of a mission whose intended mission is to go in and strike a target. But obviously part of that mission might be met with air opposition. So a strike lead ultimately is the one who's responsible for leading uh, however many airplanes, as little as two when we were just doing section operations to have led as many as 30 airplane strikes. And ultimately the training you get, I was fortunate enough to get some specified training via the Top Gun course. But then outside of that, the Navy has a really good program that we train in, uh, in Fallon, Nevada, there at Nautic, Naval Air Warfare Development Center. And it is a really methodical approach to get strike leads to the level of maturity that they need to be, not only from a flight lead perspective, which is obviously really important, but also the planning aspect, right? If you're going to be a strike lead, you need to have the the ability to lead the team on the ground to make sure that all the planning is done properly and correctly. You need to be able to brief the mission up so that everybody ensures they know what their role in that mission is. And then airborne leadership is really critical because ultimately it's about execution. So being able to go take off, rendezvous everybody together, fight through any opposition you may see, deliver bombs on target on time, and then return safely to the carrier and then missions over only after a complete thorough debrief. That's really the the role of the strike lead who's ultimately uh, the mission commander. You just mentioned something that I noticed when I was in, in the defense industry that they rarely do. And that is the debrief. (laughs) Talk to us about the debrief and why that is so critical to what we do in the air, but also to people on the ground and particularly in industry also. Sluggo, that's such a good question. And the funny thing is I found myself in my new job as a leadership and values coach at a a tech company called Online Solutions, talking a lot about feedback. And what is feedback? It's the debrief. And in the military, people often ask, since the military, hey, do you miss flying? And the answer absolutely is, of course. But one of the things I tell them about is a lot of people don't understand how much effort goes into one flight hour. The mission planning, the briefing, and the debriefing. And the thing that's most critical about the debrief is that if you want to be a learning team or learning organization, you have to spend the time to tease out the lessons learned from something you did. We debriefed every flight, whether it was the best flight we'd ever flown on, never perfect. Notice I didn't use the word perfect, right? But no matter what the mission was, every flight we went on, we went back and took the time to have a thorough debrief because you have to tease out the lessons learned from every mission so that you can only do it better the next time. And that's that's the importance of the debrief. And you learn particular skills to do that while you're at Top Gun, don't you? Because yes. you guys like the weapons school, me being at the weapons school, the Air Force weapons school, we spent a lot of time with debrief. But there are certain skill sets that you really have to have to do a proper debrief. Talk to us a little bit about what those are. One of the ways that you actually get good at debriefing is repetition. And that's one of the one of the ways that really Top Gun drove the point home is you spend a lot of time in the debriefing spaces. And one of the ways that Top Gun teaches you how to be really effective and efficient in a debrief is one, having a structure to it. And we'd always start off with safety, right? Because if you had any sort of safety violation out there, you wanna get that out of the way soon because people are gonna be thinking about that. When are we gonna talk about that? So ultimately creating a structure to the debrief 
that teases out the major learning points from each part of the evolution was a real critical part of the success of the debrief itself. Structure is a big part of it. Repetition, doing it over and over again, getting critiqued on how you conduct it uh, matter. Because if you are one that creates a, a, an environment in the debrief that people aren't comfortable sharing things, then that's not the environment where people are going to be open to learning. And one of the things, uh, Sluggo, I'm sure that, that you'll understand and appreciate this, they teach you to leave your ego and your rank at the door. Because if you're a, a senior guy and you come in and you start providing direct feedback, uh, it can it can shut down the lines of communication. And conversely, if you're a young you know strike lead under training and you come in there and want to debrief people and they're you know here you are a young ensign you know talking to an old captain those lines of communication aren't as clear and fully developed as you'd hope them to be so that's another big thing they teach is leave rank and ego at the door you know what mongo i i have a very dear friend who was an israeli f16 pilot and wow. he grounded his wing commander during a debrief oh his wing Ooh. commander forgot to go master arm on as MiGs were coming out of Syria. Forgot to go, forgot to flip the switch up. Oh boy. The wing commander knew immediately he had done something wrong. And he finally did get, but the MiGs were already within weapons engagement zone, if I remember right. And he was the strike lead. And he got to sit down with his wing commander and says, you are not flying enough. You need to fly more. You need to fly more air to air. And this was a major, major screw up on your part. And he told the wing commander, here's your training. Here's what you need to do. And you are not mission qualified until you get this done to his wing commander as a captain. <laughs> and Good for him. Commander. And that's probably on the extreme side, but the Israelis do things on the extreme because he, he walked me through that particular debrief with this wing commander. And, and the wing commander was absolutely, yep, you're right. I screwed up. You're right. I'm not flying enough. I've been spending too much time at my desk. If I'm going to lead the wing on strike strikes like this with this kind of stuff, then you're right. I need to learn it. So he was, yeah, I need the training. So with the movie out, obviously everybody wants to know about Top Gun and what it's like. Walk us through the selection process for going to Top Gun and then discuss with us the syllabus, what you teach, what is taught there so that you get the patch. So uh, great questions as usual. First off, the selection process, you have to be a good aviator, right? You at least have to have the reputation that you can fly the airplane, but it's more than that. And I think more importantly, you have to be one that can clearly communicate with people. You can brief, you can lead. And, and I'd argue most importantly, you have the humility and the personality that you can teach. Because in the early days of Top Gun, we had some guys that, that let the Top Gun patch go to their head. And, and in their approach to teaching, they ended up shutting down lines of communication. So one of the one of the selection criteria for Top Gun is to ensure that we're selecting people that, yes, are proficient and competent in the aircraft, but also when they get in front of people and teach the latest and greatest tactics, they do so in a way that it's going to be well received. So that's a big that's a big part of the selection criteria. And then the syllabus itself, one of my main takeaways that I remember was uh, I don't recall playing beach volleyball. Um, <laughs> or, you know, that was something I don't remember them them having any uh, instructors that were dating people in the organization. I do remember 13 weeks of just pure grind, uh, six days a week of scheduled events. And then of course, Sunday was spent prepping for the next. So basically seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day of just repetitive um, training events. And what those training events involved were both air to air, obviously an air to ground centric. Cause as we mentioned earlier before, we're a strike fighter. So we need to not only be able to strike a target, but we also need to be able to escort ourselves there and deal with any air to air or surface to air threats uh, on the way to the target. It was just a uh, overwhelming amount of lectures and an overwhelming amount of flights that again, and, and overwhelming is, is, is perhaps not the right term, but it was, it was so much because, you know, we just like the air force, you're only given so much time to train. So when you're given that time to solely train, you cram as much in it as you can. And to answer your question, uh, what kind of missions was it? It was really, to provide us with exposure and really get good at 
the entire spectrum of missions that the that the strike fighter aircraft uh, should be capable of doing. And you're learning about systems. You're learning about enemy and adversary tactics, their capabilities and limitations, weapons limitations, capabilities. I mean, it is, like you said, the gamut of things that you have to learn. And, and guess what, Mongo? They made all the tanker guys go through all the core classes at weapons school. We had to understand how all the airplanes employed. We had to go through all of the weapons classes, even though no bombs, no missiles, no guns on my airplane. But you never know. The first weapons school graduate may be a tanker guy in theater. He or she has to start running the ball Man, I remember those classes were incredible. They're intense, aren't they? Oh, and they were at a level that I'd never heard before. And I'm like going, how come the rest of the community doesn't have this? Well, they explained to us, that's your job. You are the one that's supposed to go home and clone you. You know, there was a lot of naysayers about a tanker weapons school. And I tell everybody, it was the worst four years of my career. Because nobody wanted us. We were we were disliked by two major commands, Air Combat Command, who ran the weapons school, and Air Mobility Command. Why are we doing this? But now we've been going for 21 years and have, I think, 216 grads, which That's is awesome. fantastic. I taught the Navy section of our syllabus. I made every class go to the carrier at sea when I was teaching. No kidding. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. We would go down to, a matter of fact, the third class, Mongo, was on the Enterprise as you guys were leaving to go east. No kidding. Merck Mercer was yeah. uh, the DCAG at the time. Yukon Godlewski was the CAG. Okay. I remember, I remember talking to him and him saying, you know, who are you guys? Why are you guys here? And I said, well, we're a tanker <laughs> weapons school and I'm trying to get my tanker guys smart on how you guys do business. Well, guess what? one of our grads ended up with, I think, Merck Mercer planning missions while you guys were getting ready to go into Afghanistan up at the Kayak. He went, holy cow. Wait a minute. I recognize you. He goes, yeah, I was one of those tanker dudes that was on your airplane. Because remember when you guys deployed, a tropical depression had just gone through the area. Remember that? Oh, yeah. And that carrier was rocking. I, I will never that. forget that. We were up in Pry Fly with the students watching you guys land in that goo where you had <laughs> maybe three or four seconds to look at the deck before you guys landed. I mean, it was amazing. It poured the night before. And I remember the Enterprise rocking like crazy. But I can remember distinctly, brother, being on the carrier and it rocking like crazy when you guys were getting ready to go out because that truck will tropical. And that was the only time I'd ever been on a carrier where I was having to hold myself up going down the hallways. Now imagine trying to land on it. You know what? Uh, the class that we had in Pry Fly, we were all up there watching you guys come down and two to three, uh, probably three to four second look at the deck. And that was it. And you were on the, and what was really crazy was those 19 year old kids were out there in that weather raining, blowing like crazy, everything. And capturing jets. I don't think we can say enough about those 19 year old kids that are running around carrier decks, launching, recovering, slinging bombs, fueling. It's the most amazing thing to watch, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And, it, and it's, that's such a good perspective you just bring up because they are truly the heroes, the ones that are on the, on the ship and enabling the, the, the jets to launch and recover every day. And they do it. They never complain. They work 12 to 14 hour days. They go get a meal. They get a little bit of sleep and they come right back and do it again. And, and they do it with a smile on their face. Hot, cold, rainy, sunny. It doesn't matter. Every day they're just out there doing their job. And it is it's, it's inspiring to see. It really is. If, if ever an American is worried about the next generation, just go watch these 19 year old kids on a carrier deck and what they do and how they perform you won't have any worries anymore about where our kids are going. So carrier air wing comes back finally. And uh, the enterprise is like decommissioned during that time. And you guys move to another carrier, don't you? We do. Um, we move over to the Roosevelt and typically um, an aircraft carrier and its air wing deploys about every year and a half. 
Well, it was actually a little less than a year later, we were right back out and deployed. And now this time heading over to, uh, to the Middle East region, a little, little different area and uh, getting, getting, getting geared up for Operation Iraqi Freedom. Talk to our listeners about how you guys get spun up to deploy, because that is in itself a whole different training exercise evaluation that a Navy carrier air wing and battle group goes through to finally say, okay, you guys got all A's and B's, you can deploy now. Absolutely. And it's, and it's like you said, it's a process. And the interesting thing is, as mentioned, it was a, it's about a year and a half process. And the reason I mentioned that is because there's a typically about a six month stand down period. And what that allows you to do is get the aircraft groomed, right? Because we ride them pretty hard when we're deployed. We usually take that, that six months to do a, a maintenance phase and, and kind of get the jets back groomed and ready. Um, let the pilots take a little bit of leave. And then after that, we spend about a year working back up. We call it literally workups. And it starts with really basic training, you know, section level training, really simple missions. And it ultimately culminates in us being out on the aircraft carrier and pretending we're forward deployed, uh, getting what's called our blue water certification so that we are uh, able to deploy and not have to have a divert. So the certification process that you reference is basically the start of that process from section level maneuvering training up to the full air wing operating off the ship in a blue water environment and having no kidding inspectors come and make sure that every aspect of the air wing is covered so that we can be certified as ready to go to include our our tanker plans, getting getting fuel competency in air to air and air to ground missions. So uh, the full gamut, uh, a lot of training goes into ensuring that we're ready for for uh, for mission deployment and uh, and the carrier to proceed out to sea. Your workups for getting ready for Iraqi freedom were condensed. The war party gets home and is getting ready to go right back out. That doesn't absolutely leave much room. that doesn't leave much. Yes. Room. No, and that's yeah, that's what I reference is that uh, that that turnaround, that quick turnaround, that year and a half got compressed to less than a year. So Carrier Air Wing Eight ends up on the Roosevelt, and you guys are heading to the Med. And I remember very clearly working with Admiral Shortney Gortney. He oh, was, God. He was the chief of the nail. And he was saying, OK, two more carriers are coming over. Truman and, uh, and Roosevelt are going to be up in the in the med. How are we going to do this, Sluggo? <laughs> He's standing at my desk. How are we going to do this, <laughs> Sluggo? And obviously, one of the problems we had was with you guys in the med, there wasn't any place for you to go. That was a real issue that we had with both of your air wings. Finally, the Egyptians open up. Talk about the Sinai crossings and how you guys did that, because those were some of the longest naval missions, I think, in naval aviation history. Go ahead and talk to us a little bit about some of these long Navy strike missions that you have to do from orbiting, the carriers orbiting above Alexandria, and you're going into Iraq the long way. Yes, the long way. So it's interesting you say that. As you know, uh, only so many aircraft carriers can operate in the Persian Gulf. So uh, we were there for a few a few weeks and then we moved out and went south and then west and then obviously up north. And we ended up in the Eastern Med and we were going to conduct sorties, obviously into Iraq, but we were still working overflight with Turkey. Obviously, the shorter route there in the in the Sinai Peninsula area would have been from the Eastern Med over uh, over Turkey and in, and then into Iraq. But instead, to your point, we had to go south, right? So we had to go south, basically around the uh, Sinai Peninsula, south to east, and then back up to north. So we'd never really done missions like this. Typically, in an F eighteen, we're flying a one plus fifteen cycle or a one plus thirty cycle, and now we were launching, getting gas overhead, the carrier from our organic tankers, our S3s, going south uh, around the Sinai Peninsula, getting gas there in the Persian Gulf, going into Iraq, doing missions, getting gas, doing more missions, and then flying the whole route home. So I I had never really done a flight much longer than uh, about a one plus four five. And now we were doing sometimes between six and eight hour missions sitting in a single seat or a two seat F-18 or F-14. And it was uh, it was taxing. Gosh, you know, and people don't realize 
what that toll is on the human body when you guys are flying those kinds of missions. You have periods of boredom with periods of intensity. And <laughs> if I remember right, the first time you guys fly the Sinai missions, we're actually kind of exploring the gas and how we're going to do that. But you guys have an actual DCA mission, a defensive counter air mission. Talk to us a little bit about that first night when you guys did this long mission. Yeah, so the ATO, the air tasking order comes out and we are scheduled to do defensive counter air. And oh, by the way, we're the night carrier. So we had 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. vol window, vulnerability window that we had to cover. So we go, we flew again to your point down south from the Eastern Med around the Sinai Peninsula and then up into Iraq uh, to get gas, to do a DCA vulnerability window, get gas, do a DCA window, get gas. So ultimately, we were parked on about between 100 and 150 miles south and southwest of Baghdad on the early days of the shock and awe campaign. So we were up there with night vision goggles, uh, capping combat air patrol, uh, waiting for enemy fighters purely in an air to air role. Um, our loadout was uh, a couple gas tanks out there and then a couple AMRAMs hanging from the wing. So we were goofy purely, gas, goofy exactly, gas. <laughs> exactly. It, it, uh, asymmetrical is the goofy gas that you're referencing. Uh, yeah, but th that's what we affectionately call it. But but goofy gas and a, and a couple air to air AMRAMs and, and some sidewinders on the wing. But we were purely decked out for that air to air mission that, that obviously we later learned was was never going to come. But you fly that DCA mission and then. Of course, shock and awe happens. And now you guys are flying these what, three JDAMs and you're still flying that same route for a couple of days, aren't you? Yes, we're still working that overflight of Turkey. But in the meantime, we now switch from a air to air to an air to ground mindset and ordinance. And now we're throwing on um, whether it's JDAM or it's LGBs. To your point, we're throwing on the air to ground ordinance and uh, we're flying that same long flight, in-flight refueling at night. And, and it was uh, heavy, 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 heavy. Fortunately, we only had to do this for like three days. And then finally, the Turks open up the, uh, it was actually the Operation Northern Watch Corridor that you guys end up using to go out there. And yes. And we had air refueling anchor areas out there. Mac and Vayner, I remember them well. That's funny. I remember planning those things, okay? But uh you guys finally get the approval from the Turks to fly out there. And what do you guys run into? Nasty weather. Talk about trying to rendezvous. Tell everybody how you rendezvous on a tanker in that kind of weather, because this is really fascinating. The main way we find you guys out there, and we're always thankful when we do find you, is our air-to-air -air radar, right? We, we take a lock. We get your velocity. We get your aspect. We, your, your altitude, we get all the information we can from you. And then we try to set ourselves on the inside of your turn and rendezvous on you. Pretty easy to do once you gain a visual of the tanker, right? You guys are a, a nice big aircraft. Um, we can find you with our radar. You know, we start getting inside of, you know, 10 miles. We can make you out really well. And it's a pretty easy rendezvous, something we've been trained to do our whole careers. Now, take away the visual aspect of that and try to do it purely by using your radar. And that's what we were doing. It's almost like a, vi a big video game with really high stakes, but we'd, we'd find you with our radar. Again, use the, the data that the radar provides to, to get on altitude, get on your wing and, and use our, your known airspeed. And that's one of the things we always appreciated about Air Force tankers, always on altitude, always on airspeed. So if we knew what altitude you were on, we knew what angle of bank you were going to use, we could use just a couple knots faster than you and be on your, you know, your 30 degree bearing line and just just walk it in purely trusting that the radar is providing us accurate data because we couldn't see you sometimes till we literally were within, you know, 50 feet. And that's where Cyrus told me, he says, man, I was so glad that I had NBGs on, but it's something we never did with NVGs on is, you know, we'd get the rendezvous and we'd have to kind of, you know, plug in with the NVGs on. And, and, and again, he said the same thing and a numerous, Oh, trigger Saunders is also a great friend. He told me the same thing too. He goes, Sluggo, that was some of the worst tanking I've ever experienced in my life because of those monster thunderstorms that happened during the winter time there in, in Turkey. Brutal, 
brutal. <laughs> and and it's funny because you you just you just brought up two separate uh, challenges. You know, one is night, which on a clear night with night vision goggles is very manageable. But then there's night with weather. The night vision goggles do zero good in the clouds. In fact, they only make it worse because you can now start to see the cloud passing and it gives you a little bit of uh, vertigo. So, yeah, a night weather tanker rendezvous was right up there with a night pitching deck carrier landing. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of looks like you're making the jump the light speed, huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a little little disorienting. Now, you guys were supporting the special ops guys and and the army never showed up up there. So talk to us a little bit about some of the missions you guys were flying up there, because now you're working with special operations guys that are on the ground and you're doing a lot of close air support, a lot of x cast, you know, on-call casts. But you have some pre-planned targets that you have up there also. Talk to us a little bit about that target set, because that was very different. Yes, very different. And again, back to the flexibility that we talked about earlier with some of the OEF missions. Rare was it that we launched with pre-planned targets, to your point. It was it was very rare that we had a known target set that was fully vetted that we would just go and know we were going to strike. So we often had uh, x cast on the schedule, which basically meant on-call close air support. So we'd launch with that full air-to-ground complement, which was typically, as mentioned, uh, laser-guided bombs uh, and JDAM. And we would go and support the special forces who were basically driving south. And it was really an interesting perspective to call those guys. And again, we're the night carrier. Middle of the night for them, we'd reach out to them on the radio and say, hey, here's who we are. Here's our loadout. What can we do for you? Sometimes it was, hey, I'm in contact. Please take care of these people. And other times it was, uh, here's an interesting story, Slogo. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but we were flying, uh, supporting some special forces army who were moving south. And I said, hey, here I am. Here's my loadout. Here's uh, here's what I bring to your table here to support. And he was started whispering back. And I said, hey, man, are you OK? Are you pinned down? He said, no, we haven't slept in three days. So I'm just giving my guys uh, the opportunity to get oh. some rest. And that was that was quite perspective for me. And, and it gets even better. I said, all right, man. Hey, I'm here. What can I do for you? And he said, I do have one question. Who won the Army Navy game? And I said, man, that was three weeks ago. And he said, you think we got the Internet down here? <laughs> and that was that was good perspective for me. And when I went home that night and had my my uh, slider hamburger before I jumped in my comfortable rack, I thought of those guys that were guys and gals that were out there on the ground getting it done. Let's think about that leadership principle, okay? My guys are asleep and I'm talking to you whispering so that my guys can sleep. That is a guy that is really watching out for his people. Absolutely. And he knows you guys are overhead. He can call on you if he needs you, but he's letting his guys sleep because I know that those guys didn't get a lot of sleep at all, at all. So I had a phone conversation with our good friend Moose one day and he goes, Sluggo, we need to move the tankers farther south. And I went, <laughs> and it was about the same time we moved Mac and Vayner down into Iraqi airspace around Mosul. And wow. if, I, if I remember right, there was some really nasty SAM sites you guys were looking for. Talk to our listeners about the Sea Deed mission you guys do, because we've talked about close air support. We've talked about DCA. But you guys are also going in there and knocking the integrated air defense system back, too. Absolutely. Um, the seed you reference, suppression of enemy air defense. Uh, it's funny, we talked earlier about being flexible. And that's one of the things we shifted to, because obviously them having a pretty robust surface to air threat was something that, that posed a threat to us as we tried to do our mission. So we had we flew with harm high-speed anti-radiation missile. And obviously we flew with some of the smarter weapons that we could use. Um, I My wingman wa- launched a uh, JSAL once that, it was one thing I'll never forget, you know, JSAL is a standoff weapon. And they said, launch and follow this JSAL toward the target and get BDA. And I came back in plain English and I said, hey, you know, this is a standoff weapon, right? It's called joint standoff weapon for a reason. You know, why are you sending me into the target area? Because they were going after a surface to air threat. And they're like, we need bomb damage assessment, BDA, that it actually hit the target. And no kidding, I flew and was following that thing and could see it on my FLIR. And just before that opened up, they fired a KS-19 gun 
And I, of course, yanked the aircraft to maneuver so I wouldn't get hit by the uh, the BBs that they were shooting up. And lo and behold, I missed the JSAO, of course, you know, opening up and, and, and ensuring that it hit the target, which I'm sure it did. But unfortunately, I didn't have the video proof because I was getting shot at. Mongo, that's an interesting load. You're carrying like two harms and a JSAO on the CD missions. Man, you talk about flexibility, all right? Now, a lot of my listeners probably know what harm is. You know, that's a pretty common weapon. But talk to us just a few minutes about what is JSAO and what its purpose is. You mentioned joint standoff weapon, but why do we have that weapon? Because I know it is a really, really good weapon. It is, again, like the acronym stand or says, uh, JSAO, joint standoff weapon. So a, a little bit about joint is, as you know, is the all the services have buy-in. But basically, what we needed was a standoff glide weapon that can be launched from long range so we can stand off from that threat and not be affected or be inside, you, you know, you mentioned WES earlier, staying outside their WES uh, by releasing something, but being able to guide that target and that, mun- that mun- excuse me, that munition to the target, again, without having to put ourselves in a weapons engagement zone of theirs. Really good weapon, really advanced glide weapon that, that enabled us to literally stand off when we wanted to strike some of the more advanced surface to air threats. And if I remember right, it comes with different types of warheads yes there are unitary warheads so basically it's got uh it's got a a little bomb in there that so now you've got a really accurate standoff weapon that can that can go and and have a a target penetration capability and a single headed munition or it's got sub munitions that you can also employ so it puts out about a football field size of sub munitions that covers a a larger broader area I remember Mongo seeing a lot of pictures in books of you guys loaded out with JSAL and Harm and also JSAL and GBU-12 to strike at stuff too. Absolutely. Uh, like you said, an incredibly fe- flexible load, an incredibly flexible load that you can use on a number of different targets. Finally, Absolutely. we're getting closer to Baghdad. We're getting, we're finally getting past Saddam Dam and you guys are flying some really long missions all the way down to, I think the town was called Sulaymaniyah or something, right on the Iranian border too. So that must have been really fascinating, concentrating on your mission, but having the Iranians like right behind you too. Yes. (laughs) Quite a bit of a a predicament, you know, and it's funny because it's the way you phrase that, it's actually the culmination of all the things that we've been exposed to at this point. Long flights, lots of tanking, bad weather, and now, uh, to your point, we're kind of boxed in, right? We're operating in an environment where it's a foul ball to violate somebody else's sovereign airspace. So we were very respectful and very mindful of not spilling into Iran. But some of the things that we need to accomplish took us right up to that border. So it's interesting that you talk about that because a fair amount of factors to have to, to deal with, you know, to ultimately put munitions on target on time but being careful of, again, navigating weather, getting the fuel to do it, and, and not violating anybody's sovereign airspace in the meanwhile. And this is where the strike lead really earns his money. Yes. You know, the strike leads really earn their money where they've got uh, those ki- that kind of environment that they're having to deal with. So did the Iranians ever say anything to you guys? The good news is I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, at least not while airborne. Never got those those warning queries that I recall. And at the at the operational level, if the air wing commander fielded a call, I never knew about it. But but airborne, no. Part of that is our professionalism in ensuring that our intentions were clear and that in and intentions, as you know, equals where you point the nose of your airplane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know? And so, what you do when the nose is pointed that direction. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Did you fly the night they did the jump into Bashur? I don't recall. I don't I don't think I that did. That was the big airdrop into Bashur. That was one of the really interesting missions that uh, the northern carriers you had know, to cover. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it's funny. I, unfortunately, my memory memory it's been so many years ago. But yes, I was absolutely airborne on that night because I I remember them briefing and and coordinating to ensure that that thing went off without a hitch. 17 C-17s loaded with like a thousand guys and all their equipment. Yes. 
talk to us a little bit yep. about what it was like watching that. I have a feeling I know where your targeting pod was probably looking at one portion of this drop. I would have put mine on the door watching these guys come out. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it, you know, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to oversell the capability of the pod, uh, yeah. but um, we were at a, a standoff distance enough that we could react to threats that were anywhere within the vicinity of the airfield. So um, unfortunately I don't have any cool stories about watching the action in place. But what I do remember is the, the craziness of the sheer amount of large aircraft that were moving through the area. And again, remember, this is all new to any of us, right? We, yes, we had just come from Afghanistan, which is a completely, not completely different, but a, a pretty different mission set uh, and landscape. And now we're in Iraq where we're doing more support for not only people on the ground, but getting people on the ground. So I, I will never forget. And it's it's funny, I say I'll never forget, but I had actually forgot that I was part of that uh, until you until you mentioned the number of C-17s. It was neat to know that you were there and part of supporting something that was much larger than your role up there as a, as a strike fighter in the airplane. It was all about making sure that they were safe, making sure that those aircraft came in and out unmolested. Pretty, pretty neat opportunity. And that was the largest airdrop that we've done since Normandy. One of the largest airdrops we've done. It had been the one into Kandahar in Afghanistan with the Marines. And now that one becomes the new standard. 17 C-17s out of Aviano, all loaded with 173rd Airborne doing the jump into this little airfield up there. And that's why we had to put that air refueling anchor area down by Sulaymaniya because you guys were having to run a long way back to get gas up north of Tikrit. God, it's funny how I remember all that stuff. I, that whole Bashir <laughs> thing just popped into my mind. Ask him about Bashir. That's awesome. And, and again, people don't realize all the planning that goes into that. B-52s are coming out of England. C-17s are coming out of Aviano, Italy. You guys are coming off of the carriers. In the Eastern Med. In the Eastern Med. And all of you have to go through this funnel. All right. Because again, the Turks aren't letting us use things that we want to. All of that comes together over this little 8,000 foot airstrip called Bashur, Iraq. And a lot of people don't realize what it takes to get all that together. When you guys were planning this, did you even talk of the 173rd Airborne guys or the B-52s or any of these guys? No. You know, spins, special instructions, mm -hmm. standard separation protocol, understanding each other's missions, being on altitude, um, on airspeed was was kind of the de deconfliction plan, you know, and that's one thing we got pretty good at sharing who needs to be where and what. And as you know, in the military, if you're told to be somewhere, that's kind of where you go and you are. So the people on the ground did a real nice job deconflicting that because, no, we never, never, never synced up with them. See, and that's crazy. Everybody coming from all those different places. And it's like, okay, well, this is where we're supposed to be. And, 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 it worked. On, and it worked. And it worked every stinking time. And I don't remember anybody. I mean, there was close calls. There wasn't any like near misses that I can remember ever hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so now you get home and uh, talk to us about the selection process for being the leader of the Blue Angels. It's actually a, a really well done process. Uh, they basically canvas. You have to be in command of an F-18 squadron because you have to roll right from the F-18 squadron to the Blue Angels. And you have to be current in the airplane, essentially. There can be a little bit of a lapse in, in, in your, your currency. But, but ultimately, they canvass the fleet and see where there's an interest and whose timing lines up. And then they invite everybody down to Pensacola. Basically, they go through a screening process where former Blue Angels and Blue Angel commanding officers sit in a horseshoe shape of about 10 of them and grill the candidates and basically ask a bunch of questions to assess if you're the right person to lead the Blue Angels. How did you find out? When you found out, is it a phone call, an email? You know, what were you doing the day you found out? Because I talked to Blaze Jensen and she was actually in Cinderella's castle at Disney World with her son when she got the phone call. Oh my gosh. Yeah, for us in the in the the, the Blue Angels and the CO role, it's a little different. Um, we all go down there in person. You have to interview in person, and they literally 
close the doors after all the interviews and have the conversation. And they announced that day. So we were all still down there. Wow. And yes, they, they tell you, and they tell you in person. Wow. It's pretty so neat. And what are you thinking when they say, Hey, Dave Mongo Koss, you are now the leader of the blue angels. What went through thinking, your head? I mean, to be honest, joy, appreciation, humility at knowing, you know, what an honor it is to be honest, fear. It's a, it's a, it's leading the blue angels is a very, very taxing thing. And something that's, uh, that's the absolute hardest flying I've ever done. Hands down, bar none. So a little bit of, wow, what have, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, in addition to all the, you know, the, the pride and the joy that you feel for, for the journey that you've been on to reach such a milestone. Mongo, talk about how you get ready for the air show season, because that is, is, that's its own event by itself. I know when you guys go to El Centro and start, you know, basically doing your workups for the air show season. Yes. So the, the training actually starts in Pensacola right after the last season ends. So there's a little bit of a down period, literally like a week where the old team transitions out, the new team transitions in. And then we do some really basic flying, like section level stuff where the boss learns how to fly the blue airplane because it's different. And the wingmen are a little closer and the new wingmen, you know, learn to fly in a lot closer of a formation. And then the whole squadron, everybody heads out to El Centro, California for what we call jet camp. And we spend from January 2nd until about the second week of March in El Centro, starting with real basic level maneuvers, simple low show type stuff, and then graduate ultimately into the full blown show where you are certified by the FAA. They're the last people to see us in our training mode. They come out to show center and watch the Blue Angel certification and ensure they're ready to go. And that is the culmination of two and a half months in El Centro, plus the couple weeks in Pensacola previously, and bottom line, 156 training evolutions before the Blue Angels ever take that show on the road. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Yes. 156 in two and a half months? Yes. Wow. It is demanding two two a days and three a days. What are the debriefs like after a Blue Angel show? The most detail oriented and critical debriefs I've ever been a part of. We literally sit in there. First off, we cover safety so we can take away any of the pressures of feeling like we need to talk about any safety events that happen. And then we really literally sluggo sit with a, a big TV screen. The whole show is reviewed and we watch the show in real time and stop and pause on every maneuver we do and use frames per second. We use measuring devices. We use everything you can imagine to hold us to the absolute highest standard. You can go on YouTube and I'll probably put that in the show notes where the diamond is flying like the the loop, the over the top maneuvers and everything. And you are unimaginably close. And of course, from the ground, it looks like, oh, that's really pretty. And that's, you know, that's really cool and everything like that. But people don't understand the pressure and the the absolute concentration you have to have while you're doing a show. Talk to us a little bit about that. It is an environment that's created from the minute you wake up. It is a wake up, study, prepare, and then it gets even more intense in the brief because once the briefing doors are closed, it is showtime. No cell phones, no external communication, no small talk. It is brief the flight the same way every time. Every flight we chair fly uh, maneuvers prior to the event itself. We stay in our bubble, you know, so we don't let external distractions get in our heads when we walk from the briefing space to the planes. We literally get in the planes, we close close the uh, canopy, and it is we, we do it the same way every time. It's repetition, and it is building on the previous flight prior it's remembering the debrief and ultimately the challenge and the good thing about the blue angels is excellence is the expectation so every time you got in that airplane it had to be 100 percent focus you couldn't have anything else on your mind and you had to go through just a methodical approach to flying an air show and the air show is the same every time it's just different checkpoints on the ground so it was just a a pure concentration 
environment where you know mistakes were at all cost avoided and and focus ruled the day. And you know what, Mongo? Sometimes your arrival show is as good as the actual show. Talk about for a moment when you guys arrive at a place, what preparation goes into not only getting there, but when you get there and you have to figure out all of your landmarks, all those kinds of things. Talk to our listeners a little bit about what that process is. So we, we do, it's a, it's a great question. We do what's called circle and arrivals before we do the first show in, in a new show site. And so before we've even gone to a show site, we're doing a map study. We literally get a photograph of the area. We mark it up with you know the runway that's there, if there's a runway and whatever checkpoints. Um, but then more importantly, we go out and fly what's called circle and arrivals. So we will run, we use a stopwatch and our airspeed to determine the distances from checkpoints. So we have checkpoints that are a mile, mile and a half, two miles, three miles. The whole show site goes out to five miles. So we will go out and literally run the lines, whether it's right up and down the main show line or it's our roll line or our left echelon roll line or whatever it is. We'll literally run those lines and get the mile points that we use for timing. And we have a guy on the ground or a gal on the ground who we're talking to and we're telling him the checkpoints we see. We'll literally say one mile, Mark, I see a tree at the corner of an intersection. Mile and a half, Mark, there's a small jiffy gas station. Two miles, Mark, I didn't see anything. I'll have to do that again. And we literally run that two or three times and try to pick those ground checkpoints. And then we go back, we study the map and we brief it. And then we go out and try to fly the show according to those new checkpoints that we learned. And that's part of that circle and arrival stuff. Before we, before we do a show, we've flown the show site, we've mapped it out, and we've done a lot of preparation before the Friday practice and then ultimately the Saturday show. That's amazing, Mongo. I didn't know you. You know, that was a question I was going to ask. What's the stopwatch for? Because you see all these pictures and videos of not only the T-Birds, but you guys too. And there's this big, massive stopwatch up on the dash. Old school time distance heading. And we literally are mapping out the show site, setting the throttle exactly where it needs to be. So we know our airspeed, using the clock to determine, you know, how many seconds it is based on how many miles per minute we're traveling. And then our heading. And that's all the information we go back and fill out that map with so that we can study when we're not in the airplane and make sure that we have the show site nailed before we get in the airplane. Isn't that incredible, Mongo? Clock to map the ground. Clock to map right? the ground. Clock in to this map day the and ground. age. <laughs> in this day and age, yeah. Because with GPS and all the other means. Oh, we have yeah. To, and, and all these fancy, you know, MFDs with the artificial intelligence uh, backgrounds. And, you know, here's the mountains, here's the highways, here's all the buildings. And we're still using clock to map the ground to do an air show. That's crazy. Right? And I know. Isn't that incredible? You are a coach at your company. You know, talk to us a little bit about what you do as a coach at your company and how your military background has helped prepare you for that. Absolutely. It's been quite an opportunity. I work for a company called O9 Solutions, and what they do is supply and demand planning software and as a subscription service. And the reason I bring that up is because it's very tech savvy, a lot of really smart and competent people. And I was brought on board as a leadership and values coach. And the values part has been relatively straightforward. The company has five core values that I make sure or I do my best to ensure that are known and enduring within the organization. The leadership part is where you, you bring up some, some good questions. Basically, using and leveraging my skills that I obtained through leading entire squadrons or wings in the Navy or to the, some of the points you teased out earlier, being a strike lead, you know, being a leader airborne. Basically, uh, the CEO brought me on board to leverage some of the skill sets that I've acquired through my 30-year military history. And it's really helping people be better leaders, you know, and we could talk leadership all day, but leadership to me is really about inspiring your people to achieve the mission and taking care of them. And uh, you, you learn a lot about that to the point you made earlier about appreciating the people on the flight deck that got us in the air every day and being able to, to do our mission, 
you know, our job in turn was to set them up with the training and the skill sets and everything they needed to be successful in their mission. And that skill set really translates into the civilian sector. And I'm sure a lot of the things that you learned while you're at Top Gun are also fitting in well, the things that I have learned from the weapons school. I, I talk about in some of the speeches I give, you know, one of one of the speeches I give is aviate, navigate, and communicate. How many times have we heard that? <laughs> you know, I love it. Just the basic, those three basic words. And yet I read an article by a gal who is a nurse and how she used that because she learned it. She went out and got her pilot license and used those three words in the emergency room. It was really a fascinating article. Well, brother, anything wow. else you want to share with us? Anything else you want to, uh, that you can think of? We've been talking for, you know, geez, over an hour. And I, this is, yeah, and I, I need to scoot here soon. But, yeah. but Mark, another thing I roll out, and I'll, you can, you, this may be of value to you or not. I developed a, an equation that I used to highlight some of the key characteristics that I think are important to being an effective leader. And it is integrity times accountability times credibility times courage times commitment plus compassion squared equals leadership. And I use a math equation, even though leadership is obviously not math, it's more of an art and it's about execution. I use a math equation because it helps me tease out what I think are important in leadership. And the first five are multiplicative because if the value of any of them is zero, then there can be no resultant, which is leadership. In other words, if there's no integrity, no accountability, credibility, courage, or commitment, then I would argue that there can be no leadership. And integrity is doing what's right when everybody's watching and when nobody's watching and when things are hard. Accountability, holding yourself to the same standard that you hold your people to. Credibility, right? Being good at your job, because if you're a leader, people have to be able to look at you and know that you're decent at what you do. Courage, leadership is not easy, right? Being able to make the tough decisions and see them through is a very important characteristic for an effective leader. And then lastly, commitment. If you're not the most committed to your organization, why would anybody else be? And then compassion is additive because we all know leaders who have gotten the job done, but they're not necessarily doing it effectively and demonstrating compassion. But I like to square compassion just to show its importance. Those are the kind of the key characteristics that I think are important in leadership. And again, I use a relatively simple equation to highlight the relationship between each of those components. That was on that slide you sent to me. Man, that's church. That's great stuff. Mongo, it's been fantastic to have you on today, man. It's great to reconnect with you again. And all of this stuff was fantastic stuff from being a strike lead, leading the Blue Angels. And, and a lot of people don't hear about what it takes to be in an air show and to be one of those people that's flying that blue airplane in a lot of different locations and sometimes flying in kind of nasty weather too. I know that you have a flat show and a high show. All of this has been fantastic, Mongo. Thanks again for being on the Lessons from the Cockpit show, brother. Thank you, Sluggo. Always great to reconnect with you. And uh, I really appreciated the time. You helped me remember some really good and memorable memories. Thank you. You're welcome. That last little bit that Mongo left us with, folks, I want to just go over real quick. The math equation he gave us. It is integrity times accountability times credibility times courage times commitment plus compassion squared equals leadership. What a great way to capture those elements of critical leadership in this really quick equation. Mongo and I spent a couple of hours on the phone folks, and I still have all of my notes from our two two-hour phone calls when I was writing my book. He gave me some great, great information. And of course, asking the right questions brought those events forward in his mind. I remember watching all of this on the board at the Kayok too, particularly the jump into Bashur where they were covering 900 plus airborne troops taking over an airfield in Northern Iraq. So I'm very grateful that Mongo came on today. Please share this and other previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit show found on my website, marcusera.com, under the podcast pull-down box. And this episode was sponsored by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. Mongo mentioned that he flew with VFA 87, the war party and their CAG Airwing billboard jet 
can be purchased from Wallpilot. And there's a link in the show notes below for you to be able to do that. There's now over a hundred ready to print airplanes you can pick from on the Wallpilot site. Folks, thanks for being with us today. And we look forward to talking to you again next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. 